So go ahead and open up to 1 John. It's way, way in the back, <laughs> right before Revelation, or I should say just a few books before Revelation. It is the letter written by the Apostle John, not John the Baptist, the Apostle John. Now, an Apostle, capital A, was someone who was called and anointed by Jesus and the Holy Spirit to be a foundation of truth. And the apostles were commissioned to take the teachings of Jesus and present the truth to Jesus' people. John was handpicked by Jesus to be one of the 12 disciples, and obviously he later became an apostle. What is interesting, in the New Jerusalem that is mentioned at the end of Revelation, it's going to be a building that kind of looks, seems like orbits the earth. It's actually going to be the dwelling place for the church, the Christian. And in the foundation stones will be the names of the 12 apostles. And so we're going to see John's name engraved in the side of that. And the, and the significance of that is, is the, you cannot know the truth for the church without the writings of the apostles. Some people think that we should throw out all the letters of the apostles, only read the words in red, so to speak, and that's not accurate. We, the, the apostles were commissioned to take the truth and communicate it to the church. They were anointed by the Holy Spirit, and John was one of them. But John was the last surviving apostle at this time when he wrote this book. All the other 11 apostles had met violent deaths. In each one of them, they were all asked to recant their faith, but every one of them stuck to their guns and they confirmed the story that their testimony was true, that Jesus was in fact Lord and he rose from the dead. What is interesting and to be noted that John actually did have to face a martyrdom, so to speak. Under Domitian, the Roman emperor, they took John and they were going to kill him by throwing him in burning, boiling oil. And it would have been a slow, painful death. The idea is, is that the oil would melt off your skin as you slowly die. But when true testimony, not from multiple sources, when they threw John in that oil, he was untouched. It didn't burn him. And he actually began to praise the Lord as he's sitting in this burning oil. And Domitian actually said, okay, obviously God doesn't want you dead. He banished him to the island of Patmos. And at that island, that is where John penned Revelation. We're going to be getting to Revelation soon. I want that to be our next book of the Bible, so you know. But at the island of Patmos is when then he was thought to be rescued by the church and brought back to the land after some years, obviously delivering the book of Revelation. And then he penned 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John was thought to be about 100 years old at this time. And at the last years of the ministry of John, he would travel from church to church and basically give this message. The message of the simplicity of the gospel, the truth, and the walk in the Spirit. This letter is not addressed to any one church. It was addressed to any believer all people who call out in the name of the Lord should know and read this letter. It is a very special letter, and we will be very blessed to read it. This letter could be generalized, or you could say that this letter is a proof. How do you know that you're a Christian? This letter is going to let you know if you're truly a Christian or not. It's kind of like in geometry. I'm not sure if you remember geometry in high school or if you had taken geometry. There is proofs in geometry. And you would get the question and say, prove that angle two and angle four are congruent angles. And then it would give you certain statements or facts about the graph. And then you would have to write a step-by-step -step reason how you could prove that these two angles were in fact congruent based upon the facts that you know. Why do you know it's true? Now, if you tried to assume that the answer was true, if they were congruent just by how it looked. So if I just sit there and say, you know, angle two looks just like angle four, so they're congruent angles. The teacher would not mark that correct. <laughs> he wants to know, how do you know? Prove to me that those angles are, correct, are congruent. Same we could say as 
At this time when John wrote this, the church has only existed for about 60 years, and at this time the church was a mess. Read the seven letters in the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the actual seven churches in that time. Five of the seven were in danger of being cast out from before the presence of Jesus. I mean, that's how bad the church got. We think that, you know, the church was more pure back then, and it's just kind of slowly gotten worse. Throughout all the centuries, there has been issues and problems with different churches, organizations, people that gather under the name of Jesus Christ. It's true today, just as it was true back then. And so John is writing this letter, showing us how we can know, in fact, if we are truly Christian. I'm not sure if you know this or not, but just because you call yourself an American does not mean that you're automatically a Christian. Or you're from Europe, that means you're automatically a Christian or South America. We look at the population percentage of how many people claim to be Christian. It's staggering. 2.5 billion people in this world claim to be Christian. It's by far the largest religion in the world. And yet, look at how much horrible things are happening. There's a problem. I Hopefully we all see that there's a problem in our Christianity. So John writes this letter and says, okay, this is how you can know. This is how you can know if you're a Christian. These are the facts. Now can you line up your life with the facts? Can you prove that your life is congruent to the facts of a child of God? Is, does your life line up with the truth? If not, you've got a problem. So this is the proof. And before we get started, I, didn't want to, I want to challenge you guys. If you commit to the study of this book of 1 John, it will change your life. This is a very powerful book that has so many truths centered in it. I mean, this is the Apostle John at the end of his life, the Lord preserving his life so he could pen this book out so we can have it today. And if you think about how much time it would take to study through this book, I mean, about three months, once a week, 40 minutes. That's not that much time. But if you do this, you will see God's word take effect or take root in your heart. I promise you that. So in verse 1, he says, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, or what was from the beginning, whom we have heard, seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Now, when John's writing of the beginning, he is not speaking of the beginning of John's life or the beginning of the church. He's referring to the beginning of time. Now, time is a concept that we are all aware of, especially in church. I have a schedule that I have to follow, and you guys expect me to keep that schedule. Like, I mean, if I started going couple hours over, we probably wouldn't be very happy. we like, I got plans to take, Pastor. But we base our lives around time. We're given so many hours in a day and a week, and I think many of us would want to even say, well, I wish there was more hours in a day. I know that I do that. I wish that there was more time in a day. But what we have to see, and what the Scripture is teaching, is that time was created by God. Since time was created, what that means is, is that time didn't always exist. God added time for his own purposes. But because it's a created thing, God's not limited to time. God dwells outside of time. What this means is, is that God sees everything at once. And there's no way you can wrap your minds around this. I mean, to try to think about it will just kind of create all kinds of questions. But to God, tomorrow is the same as yesterday. It's exactly the same. Just as today is the same as 4,500 years ago when the Tower of Babel was destroyed or when he confused the languages. He saw them both at the same time. I mean, you could kind of picture like a time chart with all the different events in history. And could you imagine if all that just happened at once? Just boom, it was all there. Well, that's how God sees it. God always is. He always will be. In fact, when Moses asked Jehovah, the Lord, what is your name? God responded to Moses and says, my name is I am. And in the Hebrew, it was hayah, like the cry chop, hayah. <laughs> 
He actually said, Haya, Haya. He says, I am, I am. And what God was saying is, I'm always there. I'm always existing. I will never cease to exist. In fact, I dwell outside of time. And so as humans, as we are now living this time, we say things like a billion years ago, a trillion years ago, did, did God exist? And the numbers that we can now come up with in our brains is just unbelievable. I mean, we can say one to the 10 to the 100th power. The number is so vast that we could never wrap our mind around that number that big. And yet it's a number. And we say, that many years ago, did God exist? Well, here's the thing. God does not exist in time. And so you can't refer to God in time. But that's all we know because that's what we're limited to. God always was and is, and he always will be all at once. In fact, it says that we exist in him. God is so awesome, and he is so powerful. And, you know, the moment that you try to think that you figured him out, you just made him too small. Think about the sciences of our day. We study physics, anatomy, physiology, chemistry, mathematics, calculus, biologies. The most brilliant minds in the world are studying information from materials that others before them have studied, and they're building upon one another and trying to amass these knowledge or the information that they've gathered. And what we understand from all that information is nothing to, to real, there's nothing in compared to all that there is to know. We're only scratching the surface. How this world works is, is flat out miraculous. You know, we can observe things in science. We have the, the equipment to look at certain things and we can study it out. How does our blood know to heal itself once you cut yourself? I mean, you cut yourself and all of a sudden it knows to go send these platelets to the cut and coagulate and then begin this healing process. How does that take place? Well, the science can say, well, it does that. We observe it. But then how it actually works is only just a guess, a hypothesis. And what's interesting is it can work in one situation and then you can go in a different situation and it doesn't work. Water, as it becomes dense or a solid, it becomes less dense, contradicting many other elements. And it's like, why do these things take place? The most brilliant minds will say, it's evolution. Life finds a way. That's the best answer that they can give us. Life finds a way? Guys, those things do what they do because God told them to do it that way. It's a program. It's information passed in cells and DNA and RNA telling everything what to do. Laws that govern the entire universe. Who told them to do that? And if you want to say the most brilliant minds in the world say, just life found a way. Well, I'm no genius, but I know if there's a painting, I know that there has to be a painter. A painting doesn't paint itself. If you have information, it has to come from something. Information just can't appear. God, the brilliance of God and his ways are so beyond what we can ever imagine or even come to know. You will never be able to understand the power and the awesomeness of God. Never. In fact, the Bible says that in the ages to come, we'll continually be learning of how great God is. We talk in time, let's talk about millions and billions of years. All the time, for all eternity, we will always be learning of how great God is. He's that big. He's that great. It has been said, if we can know all of God's wisdom and who he is, he would not be fit to be worshipped. Guys, I want to read this, what Isaiah, by the Holy Spirit, penned in Isaiah chapter 55. Listen to what Isaiah says. By the Spirit, says, God says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are beyond anything that you could ever imagine. They are past finding out. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
Guys, God is so beyond what we could ever imagine. Paul in Romans chapter 11 says the very same thing. He says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and, and knowledge. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts and who knows enough to give him advice and who has given him that it will not need to be paid back. Guys, we have to see what John is trying to say here. This is the amazing God. This is the eternal God. This is the God in whom all things exist. And God decided to enter into our time as a man. And John is still in amazement. He's like, we heard him. We saw him. We touched him. Now think about that. The disciples ate with Jesus. I imagine that they laughed with Jesus. Could you imagine that, sitting down and telling stories with the creator of the universe and hearing him laugh? John leaned on Jesus. At the last supper, he was laying on his shoulder. He was laying on God. I couldn't even imagine that. I, I, it's so mind-blowing. And, and John is seriously just blown out of his mind. He, he was the word of God. He was God. He entered into time. And he dwelt among us. You know what is very sad, though, is how many people miss the opportunity to hang out with Jesus because they were too busy. Think about if you lived back then. I would hope that I would be one of those disciples. I would want to be one of the 12 that Jesus chose. That's how I, I think I could make it. I'd want to make it. But... Many people didn't care because they were too busy. The Creator came to earth and people didn't follow because they were too busy or they didn't agree with what He taught. And what that means is that they are going to be perfectly fit for the judgment that waits them because He was here and they didn't care. You know, but I could say it almost in the same token. It's going to be the same for our generation. We have no reason or excuse why we should not be dedicating our lives to Jesus Christ. There's no reason or excuse for that. We've been given his very word. There is a church on almost every single corner. Their truth is sounding out for all people, and people just are too busy or just too proud to look into it. And I, I've talked with so many people that will look into anything else, but not religion, not Christianity, not the Bible. They don't look into it and study it out. I'm thinking, we're talking about life and death here. We're talking about life after this life and you will look into science you'll look into history you'll look into religions but you won't look into the bible and you just discount it as it was written by man so we can't trust it very sad same thing jesus was on earth and they were too busy they didn't want to spend the time to find out if it was really him but John is like, church, listen, we saw him. We talked with him. We touched him. He is the word of life. And this was a title given to Jesus. John 1.1, 1, 1, not here. Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, logos, the Greek, the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. Guys, the very word of God speaks of the power and the authority that is found in Jesus himself. There is power in words, only if someone has importance behind those words. I mean, think about your boss. When your boss says something, it means something. It carries weight. And so the authority that is given by your word is correlated to the power that your words will carry. And so God, as creator, making all things, think about how much power is in his word. <laughs> that word is Jesus. In fact, he says, I hold my word even above my own name. Jesus is the very word of God. In verse 2, he goes on to say, This one, who is life itself, was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was life. He was the eternal life. And he was with the Father. And he was revealed to us. 
We ask the question, what did Jesus come for? And some people think that Jesus came to show us how to live. Because we really wouldn't know how to, to live the moral life without Jesus showing us what morality was. And so he showed us so now we can do it. And there's those who think that Jesus came with a message, like a prophet. He brought more truth for us. And then there's those who think that Jesus came to improve the life of people in pain and hurt, to comfort those in need. And he healed people that were lame and could not see. And those are the reasons why Jesus came. Now, Jesus did do all those things, but that's not why he came. That wasn't the reason. Jesus came to bring eternal life. He was, is the eternal life. And guys, we have to see this. We have to know this. This is the foundation of the Christian life. Life cannot be created by man. Life must come from life. Everyone knows that. Science knows that. With our technology, we can take a seed, let's say a watermelon seed, and we can break it down and we can find out exactly what elements and the proper order and the amount of each element in that watermelon seed, and we can make a synthetic seed, identical. But now it's man-made. And if we took those two seeds and we planted them in the ground, the synthetic seed would never grow, but the other seed would grow. And do you know why that is? Because that seed, watermelon seed, has been passed, to, passed something in it that man cannot create, and that is life. Life has, has been implanted in that watermelon seed. And man can't create life. Guys, we can take life and we know so much about genetics that we can mutate cells and we can figure out how the body works and we can create things using life. And that's fine, that's great, but that doesn't prove to me how life started. Life must come from life. That's the only way life can exist. And we see it in the natural, we understand it in the natural. The whole idea of Frankenstein is ridiculous. Even if you sewed a person together and you had a huge lightning rod, no amount of lightning, even life comes from something, but no amount of lightning can wake, pass life into something. We understand that and we know that. But guys, it also is the same in the spiritual. You cannot have spiritual life without the life giver because you're not born with this life. You cannot get it. Guys, when God created Adam and Eve, God walked in the garden with Adam. They had, we're going to get to the word koinonia, they had fellowship, they had relationship. And God told Adam, the day that you eat of that tree in the middle of the garden, the day that I tell you you don't eat of that tree, or that tree, the day that you eat of it, you will die. Adam ate that tree, and he didn't die. Well, not physically. Spiritually, he died. Adam then died spiritually, and he was cast out of the garden. And now that Adam did not have the spiritual life in him anymore, he could no longer pass on the spiritual life because you cannot pass on what you do not have. And so death reigned from Adam all the way to Noah, all the way to us today. As you are born in this world, you are born dead, spiritually dead. Jesus came to give life, and this life more abundantly. The spiritual life Jesus came to give, guys. That's why Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world. I'm not coming here to tell people that they're sinners and they need to straighten up. He says, I came to give life. I came to make people born again. And he says, but this is the condemnation. This is what condemns people, is that the light came into the world Life came into the world and men and women loved darkness rather than the light. Jesus came in and says, I'm offering you life. And men and women say, you know what? I don't care about that life. I'm going this way. That's the condemnation right there. You see? Guys, Jesus is the life. 
that mankind needs that will bring you back into a relationship with God. The very reason why you were created. So all these questions of why you're here, why you're here. Well, the Bible answers those questions. You might not like it, but it doesn't change the fact that it's true. You were created for God's pleasure. You are God's creation. And you can try to, in your arrogance, say, well, I'm my own king. I'm my own God. I, I do what I want to do. Well, let me tell you something. In a hundred years, you will be dead. And you will go away to be remembered no more. Is that what you want to live for? If you live for Jesus Christ, we have the promise of eternal life now and forever. And that is the answer to the question of why I am here. And we all have the puzzles and dreams and hopes, all vanity if you look at it in the big spectrum. In a hundred years, you will be dead. All your dreams, gone. But those who know the Lord can have eternal life. You can have a relationship with God. And you need to listen to this because you can't do anything or you cannot say anything to bring about this life in you. It is not possible to create life from your flesh or your works. You cannot produce the life in you through your works. Remember, life must come from life. And yet, we try to make a synthetic seed. The synthetic Christian. And we have a conscience and we have an ideal of morals from the Bible, and then we try to create an environment or a society that lives morally. And then we think that if the society is moral and good, that means we have life, because after all, we all act like Christians, or we kind of look like Christians. But when it comes down to it, there's no life in it. There's no life in religion. There's no life in following rules. You can keep all of God's commandments, but it will not give you life. Because life must come from life. And it's funny because we still like want that. We still imagine this like utopia society that everyone does good. But as for a Christian, we understand that any society or any religion can only bring death. Because religions of man will only produce death. They cannot give you life. Because life comes from the life giver. It comes only through Jesus Christ. And he made it possible to you through the cross. And if you want life, if you say, I want life, Jesus says, you must give up your life. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. You say, what does that look like? It means that you remove yourself off the throne of your life. You turn from your sin and you turn to Jesus Christ as your Lord. That's what that means. And now you might think, well, I, I did that already. But remember what I said at the beginning, that this is a proof? This is the problem because everyone's saying that. Everyone says, oh, I, I, I just got saved years ago. I raised my hand in a Billy, uh, Billy Graham crusade. I'm American. I'm a Christian, of course. I believe in Jesus, baby Jesus. Everyone says things because we live in this society. But have you really been saved? And not only saved, have you been born again? If you have not been born again, don't call yourself a Christian because you're not. You're a fake. And you think Christianity is in terms of religion. Christianity is not in terms of religion. Christianity is in terms of relationship, life given to you through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus was a, a Pharisee, a righteous man. He couldn't get it. What are the results? What should be coming from your life? Well, let's go on. Verse 3, it says, We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you might have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The result of the spiritual life in you will be the fellowship that you have with Jesus, with God, and with his people, the church. Now, because we have... 
the language of fellowship that has been kind of like a Christianese term. And Christianese is a Christian language. You go to church, you hear those type of words being used, and sometimes you wonder what they mean. But we just say fellowship. And so we have different ideas of what fellowship is. We have fellowship night. <laughs> what that means? We play games. We hang out. What? Or we have even a word fellowshipping. <laughs> We're fellowshipping. <laughs> We're over there talking. But I think it's important to know the Bible was written in Greek. And they actually use the word koinonia. Now, koinonia doesn't translate over to English because of what it means. There's no English equivalent to that word koinonia. You'd have to use multiple words. In Greek literature, the word was used to imply the strongest bond between two people. You could use it in marriage. Koinonia. It was the idea that you shared everything. What was mine is yours, and what is yours is mine. Koinonia. It was even used to describe a sex between two people. Koinonia. Becoming one with. That is the root, that is the word, koinonia. Christianity used this word to describe the bond between you and God. And not only you and God, but between you and fellow Christians. That you guys would be so united together that we would see ourselves not as individuals alone, but that we would be individually members of one another, that we all would be on the same page, that we would love each other with a fervent love because we're all of the same kind. We all serve the same Lord. It was a deep love and it was a deep care for one another. And Jesus said, it, this, this is how all men will know you're my disciples because of your love for one another. He was talking about this koinonia that was going to take place. And it was a love that was dedicated that it didn't expect anything in return. When you read the book of Acts and when the church was birthed, you know what was the very first thing that took place in the church? People took all their possessions and they sold them and they just piled all their money together and they basically created like a socialism, a communism. And why did they do that? Because the love for one another was so great, they saw everyone in the same, as the same. And so it says, like, why should I live this way and see that person over there, my fellow brother living that way? Let me help him. And that love was so powerful that that's what took place in the early church. And read the book of Acts, and that's what you're going to see. This genuine love that was so loving that they would be willing to give up everything of their own to help out someone else. And do you think that was produced in them by themselves? No. Now, I don't think that they got that right. That was not a commandment from the Lord. God did not tell them to sell everything and set up a communism or set up socialism. They just responded to this love that they had. And if you study the history of the church, the early church, it didn't work out well for them because what actually happened is it bankrupt itself. Because as people came into the church, they were giving out and those type of things just don't really work. And we know that. We live in a society that understands that. You wish more people would understand that, but it doesn't work. But that's what was happening. But what we need to see and what is to be admired in it is the commitment and the love that we would see towards one another. We should see that. Not a building. I'm not talking about an organization. I'm talking about a group of believers whose lives are to be centered around Jesus. And this is what you should see. As you've been a part of Calvary Chapel and as God has given you his life, you feel this pull, this drive to be around feather, fellow believers, fellow Christians. And I hopefully, I don't know this to be true. I can only speak from personal experience. Going to church was the highlight of my week. I like just tried to get through the week just so I could go to church. Because when I went to church is when I was going to be around people that I loved. And when you're around people that you loved, it's no burden. It doesn't matter how tired you are. It's you're around the people that you love. And that is how it's to look, guys, as God's Spirit is in you. 
And guys, this is the proof that you have eternal life. And you know what's sad? Because in our flesh, we don't like that. We're taught to be individuals. I have my own personal walk with the Lord. I don't need a body to be part of. I can watch church on TV. Me and Jesus are buddies. We don't need church. Guys, that's actually incorrect. You say, what? Verse 7, and we're not going to get there this week, but let me read this to you. It says, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. Now, we don't see it that way. We see it. If I'm walking in the light as God is in the light, then we're going to have fellowship with God. I'm going to have a personal relationship with God, and that's going to be it. That's how we see it. But God says, no, if you are walking in the light as I am in the light, then you're going to know it because you will have fellowship with one another. You will feel this pull to be part of a church, part of his people. And it's so supernatural, but it's so true. As we walk in the light, as we are living in the spirit, we will feel comfortable and feel a desire to be with Jesus' people. And guys, this is the truth. It's not easy. This is the truth. If you feel no pull to the gathering of believers, I would question the life of God in you. I would say that you do not have God's life in you. Why? Because the proof, the fact is, is if the life of God is in you, you will have fellowship one with another. And how many people are being deceived by that alone? That they do not need to be in fellowship or with God's people anymore. That they can just separate themselves because me and God are like this. Guys, life is living. It's real. And if God's life is in you, it's going to do something. You can be sure of that. You will know it when you have it. And a pull is going to be in it the family, the body of Christ. We will be closer than anyone else, even closer than our unbelieving family outside of the church. It's true. Now, here's what's really cool. There is such a joy and a love as we gather together to worship the Lord and study his word. It's such a blessing in it. To be around each other is so great. Now, here's, here's the part. We're a room full of sinners. We make mistakes every day. We make mistakes. You sin every day. I know I sin every day. We're not living in a habitual lifestyle of sin, but we blow it. And because we blow it, we might offend one another. We might do something to hurt one another. I might say something or do something to offend you, and you're going to say, Pastor Charlie, what a jerk. <laughs> but guys, we are to forgive, which means that we do not hold grudges against one another because the love that we've received keeps no record of wrongs and it suffers long. We just love each other because God loves us. And if we learn this, if we know this, what's going to be the byproduct? Last verse, verse 4. We are writing these things to you that you may fully share our joy. The joy of the Lord. So much more than happiness, guys, because happiness can be taken away from us. If I came up to you after service and I said, God laid you on my heart, and God told me to write you a check for $10,000, and I gave you that check, you would be so happy. You'd be like, hallelujah, Lord. <laughs> Answer my prayers. Then you, then you go to the bank and you cash it. Bounce. <laughs> that dirtbag Charlie lied to me. <laughs> Your happiness would be gone like that. <laughs> Joy does not get taken away by circumstances. Guys, we have it so easy to compare to the early church. They could be killed for being a Christian. We have no... We think it's persecution when we, like, someone says, you can't pray here. We're like, oh, we're persecuted. It's like, come on. Or they laugh at you because you're saved. We're like, oh, it's persecution. I mean, like, how wimpy have we really become? The early church was in danger of losing their life for being a Christian. And they still had joy. 
They still had that peace and that love and that contentment that came knowing that they were going to be with the Lord. That's joy. Guys, I write, as John is saying, I'm writing to you these things that you might have joy. You might share in our joy. As we come to the cross today, as we partake of communion, even the word communion comes from the word koinonia. It's the idea of becoming one with our Lord and with our Savior. Now, I think it's important to realize this, that the cup and the bread, the juice and the bread, they're just symbols. You could put water in there. It's a symbol. It is to represent something to us. It was to remind us. He says, when you do these things, do them in remembrance of me. It was to remind us of what Jesus did for us. Listen, Jesus died on the cross. He gave his body to be broken, his blood to be spilled, that you might have the forgiveness of sins. And he rose from the dead that you might have life. Eternal life is yours if you will receive it. But it's up to you. That choice is yours. Do you want it or do you not want it? And you, if you're at the place where you say, well, I want it, just remember, Jesus says, okay. But remember, the cost is great because it will cost you your very life. You must dethrone yourself from your life and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. If you are still on the throne, you're still in the way. They always say the, the farthest gap in all the universe is 18 inches from your head to your heart. And you can know something up here, but until you really fully surrender, you're never going to know it. Give your life to Jesus. Surrender your life to God and find that thing that you've always been looking for the very life of God, the missing link. <laughs> As humanity, we're looking for the missing link and we're looking to the ape. Where's the missing link? We're looking down. Missing link. God's spirit. Man was created in the image of God. Think about that. Let's pray.